Okay, so miscellaneous topics, anywhere from equilibrium to gases, uh, to thermodynamics, uh, to intermolecular forces for this review. All right. So here we go. This one is from 2017. Uh, gives you a formula in the beginning. It says carbon tetrachloride uh, can be synthesized according to the reaction represented above. Chemist runs reaction at constant temp in a rigid container. A. And then there's an I and a double I, which we like. This chlorine gas is initially present in the container at a pressure. I, how many moles of Cl2 are in the container? All right, help me out. What's the gut reaction that I'm doing concerning what I've been given? PV equals NRT. If you don't see it, I was given a V, I'm given a T, I'm given a P, and they want an N. Now, just to be careful, just hold on one second. Maybe you're already going. You have to make sure that what it's asking for is a gas. And I'm sorry, and the information that you have is also related to a gas. Like sometimes what you're doing is you're being given some information about something else. Now with moles, it's a little different, but you just want to make sure that it all correlates and it's asking for moles of a gas. So that I feel really good about that. It's not asking for moles of something else. I don't have to go further yet by finding that and then converting it with a mole ratio. Okay, so I'll give you a second to do this. Uh, this should feel good. Like you should be excited when you recognize because usually this is worth two points. Got to make sure we're in Kelvin. So they only made us convert one thing. Uh, on the AP exam, I've never seen a PV equals NRT ever done in anything other than uh, atmosphere. So the R value will be good. If you did three sig figs, your plus or minus off of that is one. It's fine. The reason why it's only two, technically, is that the pressure is in two sig figs. So that was actually only worth one point, which is very surprising. Uh, usually it's two. So if it's an I double I, it has to be related. It just is. So I'm asking for the grams of carbon disulfide that are needed to completely react with the chlorine. So I'm, I'm not going to say anything. What, what can you do for that? Can you try to put something down? <laughs> so I hope that you figure this with stoichiometry. Oh, for those that can't hear what's actually happening in the scene. Um, so just understand you're going from one compound to the other. I hope that you recognize what needed to be done. You may not have that exact molar mass, it's fine. So, check this one out though. They rewarded you. So maybe they didn't give you the two points for the um, PV equals NRT, but they actually gave one point for the mole ratio. Again, this isn't like you have to memorize. I just think it's nice to see uh, what you're getting points for. So one point for mole ratio and then one point recognizing that you are going uh, to the other compound with the molar mass. Okay, so nice little start off on this one. Um, this was the first question of last year's test, the actual exam. So, so far so good. But then there's, it resets and once in a while, you may feel a little uncomfortable. So letter B, at 30 degrees, reaction is thermodynamically favorable but no reaction is observed to, uh, to occur. However, at 120 degrees, the reaction occurs at an observable rate. Okay, so they're, they're, it's happening no matter what, but what it's saying is that at 120 degrees, we see it happening. At 30 degrees, we really don't see it. Kind of like the slow decomposition of hydrogen peroxide versus doing it at, uh, as a demo with um, uh, elephant toothpaste, maybe. The uh, reaction of paper with oxygen versus lighting it in a fire, maybe, like, you know, you don't see it. I'm not like, oh my gosh, look at that paper slowly reacting with that oxygen. So, I and double I again, nice. 
feel like I talk about that a little too much, but... <laughs> Explain how the higher temperature affects collisions between the reactant molecules so that the reaction occurs at an observable rate of 120. All right, come up with a sentence, no more than two, if you want to talk to somebody else what you think about it. So at 30 degrees, we don't see the reaction. At 120 degrees, we do see the reaction. So what do you think we need to talk about? And they're giving you uh, clues. What is the higher uh, temperature, what is the effect that it has on the collisions so we actually see it at 120 degrees? Okay, so try to come up with some sort of a sentence or so that uh, actually gets your point across or uh, gets you to the answer. All right, so I hope that you talked about potentially the molecules speed up, but if they're speeding up, that means that it's increasing the number of collisions. But you can also be a little smart about this. If you look at the next problem, they have activation energy. It's an I double I. You could actually reference this. So I, I want to talk about something because it's going to help us with this before I give the answer for I. Is that we don't always think about this because we don't think about big reactions or ignitions or combustion as an activation energy. Every reaction has an activation energy. We just don't think about it when it just occurs because it's really, really low. Okay, so if we're seeing a reaction occur, that means that reaction, those collisions, that interaction has enough energy that it has crossed or uh, surpassed the barrier, the activation energy barrier. So an answer that you could say is that the molecules have more energy, which causes more collisions, and those collisions there's a greater number of collisions at or above the activation energy. That would be the perfect answer. I'm going to read what they actually have. Uh, I might not be phrasing it exactly the same way. If you reference that there'll be greater number of collisions or the uh, collisions would be at a greater energy, you probably are going to get the point. It says, at the higher temperature, the particles have a greater average kinetic energy than the lower temperature. Thus, there'll be more collisions with sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy. Every reaction has to overcome an activation energy. Just most of them, it's not a big deal. The fact that they interact, that's enough. Okay, so hopefully you reference it in some way. I, I honestly don't think that they're trying to blow your mind on this one. Just you understand as you increase temperature, uh, you're having more energy. The more, ener uh, the more energy uh, that's in a molecule, they're uh, moving faster, and those collisions will occur more often. And maybe the thing you're missing is those collisions have uh, a greater energy within them. Double I, though. This, we don't touch on this enough. And I'm glad this is in this one. The graph below shows a distribution for the collision energies of the reactant molecules at 120 degrees. Okay? Draw a second curve on the graph that shows the distribution for the collision energies at 30 degrees. Okay, so this is all of them. This is like below here. You don't have to draw on yours. But these are all of the collisions that occur. Okay, so what you need to understand is that it says the energy of collisions, okay, so as we're going over, the, the collisions are gaining more and more energy, and this is the fraction of collisions. So this is where the, this is the greatest number of collisions at this energy. So we, you can see um, is that right here, that's the number of collisions that actually uh, are at the activation energy and after. Actually, I should draw it this way. So that's it. So it, it's showing the number. The higher the peak, that's the amount of, of uh, collisions that are happening at that uh, energy and so on and so forth. So this, all of these are not reaching the activation energy. That means all of this is not reacting, or at least some things still overcome the activation energy just due to gaining a little fraction of energy from other sources. But the blue is the only part, those, react, those collisions are the only ones that are actually reacting. So they might collide, jump around, uh, fly around a little bit, and then collide again and have greater energy, then it'll happen. But it's only those ones that are in the blue that make it. So what we need to do, this is at 120. So let's just think about this for a second. At 30 degrees, are we going to have more or less reacting? Less, okay, right? So the energy is less. So what you want to show... And just, I, I just love for you to guess. If you do in pencil, you can always erase this even, or maybe it's not a guess. Can you show me a, a curve that would illustrate more collisions not reacting, and the ones that do, there wouldn't be as many, correct? So can you try to translate that? I'm just trying to tell you what you probably understand without the curve. Like, if it's at a lower uh, temperature, I have less reacting. 
So what I need to do is show that on here. And let's just see if you get what I'm going to draw, okay? So just give it a shot. You can always just erase this, okay? See what you can come up with. And there you have it. So where is more of the, the hump going to be? <laughs> to the left, correct? So you can't, I don't know how you did it, but to me, I guess, I would have done something. I'll just draw it in blue. Like something like that. Like it, there has to be more of it. The fraction has to be higher. Does that make, and if you're like, well, mine's a little more to the left or a little bit more to the right. That's fine. Although because it has less energy, I would think it'd be more to the left. I mean, it, that is fascinating. And then I would probably be lower over here. So here is the key. And you can see what you got. If you had a higher peak anywhere over here, you would have gotten a point. If your line went below this, you got another point. So what you're showing is that more of your collisions, that's what this means, more of your collisions have lower energy. And what you're showing is the ones that are going to have enough energy, there's less of them. Okay? So I, I hope that makes sense. So I don't know. I have a feeling, I hope that at least some of you had one of the two, just because of how you kind of drew it. But I hope that does make sense. Like, you only have so much area to play with. I mean, you can't be like, well, yeah, I'm going to have less. And then it's like that. Well, you don't even have the same number of collisions. So now your idea of space and, and quantity is way off. All right. But we move on. And what I love about chemistry problems is that most of the time it does reset at some point. And this one completely resets. So don't bail. Don't allow yourself to get too negative about something because there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, it says S2Cl2 is a product of the reaction. I, in the box below, complete the Lewis electron dot diagram uh, by drawing in all the electron pairs. Again, it, you can put a bond, and I'm going to let you try double I right away. It says, what is the approximate value of the bond angle in the CLSS bond uh, that you drew uh, in uh, the problem above? Okay. If the two CLSS bonds are not equal, include both angles. Let's give it a shot. Really good. So with this, honestly, to me, I always assume just octets, and we're good to go. So I would have drawn something like this. Because S is a center atom, I, and it's on the third uh, row, I could fear that it breaks the octet. But usually things that break the octet are a center atom, and everything's only going to it. And because I have two center atoms. I'm really not worried that that's going to break the octet. What could I do, though? I could count these up if I had to. If, I, if I'm if i really having extra time, I could say 6 times 2, so that's 12 electrons. 7 times 2, that's 14. That would be 26. And I could go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 20, 20, 20 4, 26. If I really wanted to feel heavy percent. What is the approximate value of the bond angle? Well, what do you do? It's CSS. So I'm looking at this one right here or the other one. And what you do is you count the clouds. So if you said four clouds, steric number of four, I wouldn't mind writing that down again just so you see that phrase if it ever comes up. Um, it's a steric number of four. So what does four mean? If you went parent geometry and your brain went to that, you would have said tetrahedral, right? You didn't ask for a name of shape, I don't think. What is tetrahedral's angle? 109.5, right? You would have gotten it right. I don't think that's right, though. What shape is this actually? It's a tetrahedral with two lone pairs, so it gets pushed down once, and it gets pushed down again, so it's a, it's a bent. And what did we learn? Every time you add a lone pair, that, that angle gets pushed down by basically two degrees, right? So the angle I feel the best of all would be 105. They give you 104 to 110. So if you don't know, just... Throw something down. Throw a 109.5. Throw an angle you remember. You, you, you might get away with it. And there's different reasons for that because of the atoms that actually exist and it not following the exact stereotype of that angle or that shape every single time. So um, that's kind of nice. But that would have been one point each. I can't imagine anything else. Okay. Uh, finishing it up. D. Uh, Carbon tetrachloride can also be produced by reacting those two at 400 degrees as represented in the equation below. At the completion of the reaction, the chemist successfully separates the CCL4 from the HCL by cooling the mixture to 70 degrees, which 
at which the, uh, what temperature, or at which the temperature condenses the CCL4 while this HCL remains in the gaseous state. Okay, so here we go. This trend is a transition now to IMFs. This is everything. This could be like it's review by itself. Like you're going home after this. Um, identify all types of intermolecular forces in HCL liquid. All right, and then I'm gonna let you do both these again. Double I. What can be inferred about the relative strengths of the intermolecular forces in the CLCL4 liquid and the HCL liquid? Justify your answer in terms of the information above. So you really do have to kind of reread what it's saying. Can you? What? I'll give you one hint. What is it trying to just talk about? Truly, it's trying to have you just say which one's stronger. They may have the same IMFs. Well, then you got to say why one's stronger. Let me just say one last thing before we go. Sometimes, like I hope we all agree, I, I don't want to ruin this problem here. I, I'm just saying two things. An H bond is stronger than a dipole dipole, or a dipole dipole is stronger than a London. But even if you figure out something has a London and something has a dipole dipole, based on information, you could say, well, based on the information, the London appears to be stronger than the dipole dipole. That has happened. Okay? So make sure that you go into it going, okay, what are they? I've identified the IMFs. Now, what are they telling me? They're telling me that this one or this one has stronger IMFs. I need to just say it, it apparently that is strong because of it. Okay? So give it a shot, see what we can do, and then we'll transition to the next problem. So on here, please understand this right here. If you do not do this, you may not get the points. Identify all types of intermolecular forces. Everything always has an LD, right? So if you didn't write an LD, you may not get the points. I'll come back and see. Yep, you would not have gotten it. When it says all, you basically have to make a list. So if it has H bonds, that means it has to have H bonds, dipole, dipole, London. If it has dipoles, then it's dipole, dipole, London. If it's just London, you don't write London twice. <laughs> so in this one, it's different. So it's HCl, so that means it's polar. The minute it's polar, it, it is at least a dipole, dipole. Many students who write hydrogen bonding, if you wrote that, you got tricked because you need to have fun with hydrogen bonds, right? So it has to have an F, O, or N to be a hydrogen bond. That is not it. So this would be dipole, dipole, and London, dispersion force. You get one point. It actually says one point is earned for both types of forces. Okay. Double I, finishing this up. It says, what can be inferred about the relative strengths? Okay, so what it tells you is that CCL4 condenses while this becomes a gas. Okay, so at room temperature, at room temperature, what I have, this might not hurt to write this. It actually becomes a liquid versus... This is not how it's written in the problem. I'm writing it out based on the situation they gave me. So they're saying now that that's a liquid and that's a gas at room temp. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means at room temperature, which ones are more attracted to themselves? Which ones are stickier? These, right? Does that mean it's greater or weaker IMFs? Greater, right? The stickier it is, the more attracted it is to itself. So this is going to be a greater IMF, and this is going to be a lower IMF. That, that's how that looks. So now, what you do need to do is potentially talk about why. Okay, I thought it was going to make you do more than that. Um, all you really have to say is that these would be stronger IMFs, uh, the intermolecular forces would be stronger than uh, the HCl. I actually would have thought they would have gone into the fact that there's a greater mass here, so maybe the, uh, the, 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 the electron clouds are creating a greater uh, polarizable uh, force from one to the other, but you did not need to go in that much detail. So when they're just asking about strength, now you just have to say it. Because this is a liquid, it's more attractive to uh, the other molecules of CCl4. And that's why it has a stronger IMF. Okay, so that is that. All right, we're going to transition to the next one. So the second, this is the second question of 2017. We have not done this yet in our review. So I went out of my way to make sure I found it, and it didn't have to look very far. Uh, but I would have if I had to. Uh, it says two possible Lewis electron dot diagrams are shown. A, explain why the diagrams on the... Explain why the diagram on the left is a better representation for the bonding. Uh, justify your uh, choice in formal charges. So check this out. Like a lot of AP questions, it's already telling you that the left is better than the right one. OK? 
That's interesting. So I don't, I, I think they're letting you off the hook. But they're saying using formal charges. So, oh, I don't remember how to do that. If you don't remember, you're, you're done, right? So let's talk about what formal charges mean. It means that it's the most favorable bonding with electrons. So uh, the bonding uh, in terms of electrons. Let me show you. So what we do is it's valence electrons. It's how many electrons you bring to the party. Okay. And then you subtract how they're sharing the electrons. So it's um, bonds plus lone pairs. The number of bonds plus the number of actual electrons that are loaned, like that you're not sharing. So what you're sharing and then what you're not sharing. Let me translate that in a more uh, common way that we deal with it. What does carbon usually like to bond as? How many bonds? Four. That is most favored. So the, stair, the formal charge would be zero, right? Oxygen likes to bond two times, right? So what you could do, let's just say you totally forget this, because of everything we have to learn, to have to try to memorize that too, may not be the greatest thing for you. F would be one. So what I'm trying to get across is if you totally forgot, you should still understand that formal charges reflect that if it bonds exactly the way that it should, quote unquote, then it would be a zero. You might be able to figure that out then. Like how can I make this be zero? So nitrogen, even this, you have to bond three times. Okay, fine. It brings five to the party. Oh, here, let me show you. So check it out. You don't focus on things that are the same. What do I mean by that? Look at your nitrogen. See how it has four bonds on each side? It doesn't change then. It's bonding the same way. A triple bond and a single bond and two double bonds is bonding the same way. Hydrogen is bonding the same way. The carbons and the oxygen look different. Okay? So what I do is I would show it somehow. So this is how I'm going to show I'll just show it right here. Carbon brings four to the table, and then I have four bonds and no lone pairs. Okay? This oxygen brings six to the table. And if you ever, what, what are you talking about? So I'll give valence electrons on a periodic table. And then what I have is one bond and six unbonded electrons. So what's that? Negative one. And you're like, whoa, whoa, that wasn't supposed to be a negative. They're supposed to be zeros. If you still don't remember how this works, it'll make more sense in a minute. Going to this one, that carbon brings four to the table. And then how does it share it? I have three bonds plus two electrons. So that is negative one. And this oxygen brings six to the table. And then I have uh, two, come on. two bonds plus four. So you look at that and you go, oh, they're the same numbers. Negative one and zero and zero and negative one. Can anybody remind me how we decide that when we have a negative? Anybody bringing this way back deep in the file? Which one has to have the negative? The most? Yeah, the most electronegative. Yes. So the one to the most upper right on the periodic table gets the, mo the, the negative one because that means that it pulls more electrons towards itself or it has more electrons on, uh, on the atom. So that's why this one's more favored. I'll read exactly what they have. This is quite long. It says in the diagram on the left, it tells you the, the numbers. So the diagram on the left is a better representation because it puts the negative formal charge on the oxygen, which is the more electronegative or more electronegative than carbon. One point is earned for the correct assignment of formal charges. One point is earned for the correct ex explanation. So if that ever would come up, I'm hoping even if you just remember the idea, okay, I know that if it bonds the way I've learned it, it would be a zero. You're all smart enough to probably be able to kind of quickly figure that out. And if not, you at least give it a shot or you have an opportunity to get that ready. If you don't, you move on. Okay? So, all right, letter B, this actually we have done. But we're going to quickly go through it very fast. It says, using the Lewis electron dot diagrams of the two acids shown in the boxes above and the table of bond, en uh, bond enthalpies below, determine the value of the change in H for the reaction. Okay, so these are bond energies. Please, please note... These don't say enthalpy values of a compound. It has, has of the actual bonds. So what do we do with that? It's what's 
what, what's the equation? What do we, how do we add or subtract these up? Yes, it's bonds broken minus bonds formed, not products minus reactants. Okay, products minus reactants are when they actually give you compounds. And to be honest, guys, we don't have an equation yet, like an actual like uh, chemical reaction. So if you don't have a chemical reaction, uh, it's pretty hard to talk about it. Um, oh, there it is. Sorry. But they usually give you a lot more of that. Um, and they didn't give you it as compounds. They gave it to you as bonds. So we need to break it all down. Luckily, they give this to us. This one's here. This one's here. I have to break these. I have to form these. Okay? Very important. They, they are throwing this out here. It's not a hard concept, but ev almost every student messes this up. So what I would need, I'm going to write it down this way instead of the actual numbers. I need an HC. I need a C triple bond N. I think this is just more descriptive. Okay? And then I subtract. Why do I subtract? Because when you form a bond, it releases energy. That's why it's a subtraction. So these are breaking the bonds. And now I need a HN. I need an N double bonded C, double bonded C and a C double bonded O. And I need to form those bonds. If you had two of one of those, if you had two of one of those, you put a two in front, right? If you had two in one area, but we don't. So I'm going to just do the math for you. If you want to punch it in or you want to punch it in later, I'll, I'll do this for you. This side right here, I think this will just help, um, is 1505 kilojoules. And this side right here is 1751. Please, it's the whole thing, not just one. So when I'm all said and done, that is not okay how I wrote, like, I'm actually doing this problem, I write each number down. So, um, just so I've modeled this one time, I've put 413, right, plus 891, so on and so forth. Okay, so, um. I just want you to recognize, if you're giving bond energies, it's you got to break them. you got to actually break those bonds, and then you got to make new bonds. It's not products minus reactants. Now that's only if you have actual enthalpy values of making each compound, and now you add them and subtract those. Uh, we have this, but let's see if you can remember this. It says, the student claims that the change in S for the reaction is close to zero, meaning that it really doesn't gain any disorder. Explain why the student's claim is accurate. Anybody remember this? If you're not given any other information, it's always hidden in the reaction. So why is it basically zero? Because I'm going from one mole of gas to one mole of gas, right? Very important to recognize that, right? So letter C. It's probably poorly worded, but... Please understand, you don't have to prove... You don't have to go out of your way to say that it's not changing entropy. They already said it. You just have to say why. All right? You have to explain why the claim is accurate. They're saying it's accurate. Why are you saying it's accurate? You don't have to say, again, don't ever disagree. Actually, I disagree. I have seen that. I have students. That's not fun. Um, final part. Again, we did this one quickly. Which species is present at higher concentrations at equilibrium? Justify your answers in terms of thermodynamic favorability, and the equilibrium constant. Woo! Okay, so um, more or less, they have, they're trying to give all this to you. The very fact that they say thermodynamically favorability, <laughs> that is change in G. They said equilibrium constant. So please find that on your orange sheet. They're going out of the way to say basically um, calculate this. found that right so here's the thing they're saying justify your answer in terms of thermodynamic favorability and the equilibrium constant to show that uh, which one so 
what you need to understand is that if you're talking about this, this is a, actually a more in-depth question than it might appear. If this is zero, then this is out. And I already know change in H is negative, right? So that means that this is negative. That means this is negative. So then what does that mean for my K? K would be positive. And you'd be like, okay, I, I don't have, I don't want to punch this in. Or I'm, I'm being lazy, which you could actually punch this in and get a K. If it's favorable, it's always favorable in terms of the reaction you're shown. So if G, a G is negative, it's going this way. It's going to happen. So then that means K must be what? We always say greater or less than 1. It would be greater than 1 because that means it's product favored. Okay, that, that's multiple steps there, but that's how G and K relate. So yes, I made you look up that equation. Some of you definitely would use it. It's not a crime to actually use an equation to help prove it, but don't just write an equation and be like, see, like you need to explain it then. Yes, it could be 1145, I'm sorry, not 1130. The G came from here, so this is the H. And we said that that was zero, so I could get that G. And then now I can solve this because I have R and T. If you don't know T, you always assume it's 25 degrees. Always. I don't know if they gave it to us or not. Doesn't matter. There's a little degree sign, so that means it's 25 degrees. All right. Now, we had done that. We had not done this. So to finish it up, now we transition into something completely different. It says ammonium salt of the isocyanic acid is the product of the decomposition of urea. Um, represented below, a student studying the decomposition reaction runs the reaction at 90 degrees. A student collects data on the concentration of urea as a function of time, as shown in the table and the graph. E, the student proposes that the rate law is rate equals K times the CO and an H2 2. I, explain how the data support the student's proposed rate law. Okay. Here's the trick. We're talking about decomposition, and again, I, I will talk about this in one moment, but it says, uh, it gives you the rate law right here, that tells you a lot of information. And if you're not recognizing what it's telling me, it's telling me that this is first order. Okay? It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So, I'm going to see if I can get any other hints from this. Shoot, I can't. It's okay. Um, so, when there's decomposition, if you don't realize this, what this is actually showing potentially is when something's breaking down over time, we can talk about half-lives. This is where this will work for you. Okay, it, it can be a rate. So, uh, I don't, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. So the second one says. Use the rate law and the student's results to determine the value of the K, include your units, and like I still have nothing. Or we can use a half-life equation. But a first order reaction, let's think about this. What do we do? When we double it, the rate doubles, right? When you triple it, the rate triples. Well, in this case, um, it's the same idea actually for de decomposing with the uh, the uh, half-life equation. Actually, I'm going to write this down. Actually, you find it. Can you find the half-life equation that's on your orange sheet? Let me have you do that. Let's do that first. I hope you found this. Right? So, now, unfortunately it doesn't talk about concentrations or anything else, but I guess, I think I'm making this harder than it needs to be. If something's first order, it, it again, if it doubles, it, um, the rate doubles, same idea. As it breaks down, it, it, it consistently breaks down uh, in that same manner. So let me show you. If I was at zero and I'm at point 0.1, if I 
cut that in half. Okay, so half of that would be where am I? 0.5 would be 10 minutes, hours. If it consistently does it, it's not exponential. It's 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 a consistent. It's not doubling and tripling and having some sort of an exponent. This is first order then. So when's the next half life? How long? Well, the half life would be from 0.1 to 0.25. So then. Point 0.5, so the next half-life would be 0.25. Well, let's see if that makes sense with the time. And look at that, it's about, it looks like it's about 0 0.025. Wow, sorry people watching. And look at that, 10 hours, 20, uh, another 10 hours, it keeps, it, it's consistent with the amount of time. So this is reflecting a first order, if the first one, uh, was 10 hours and then you had exponential time, like it wasn't uh, corresponding to that same uh, ratio, it would not be a first order. So that's uh, how it works. It, it, let me reverse this. I'm thinking about the next problem and I'm making it too hard. Um, it is evident that the decomposition reaction has a constant half-life, which indicates the reaction is a first order. It's constant. It's, it's consistently the same as you go down to it. I made that much harder than it needed to be. Double I, using the proposed rate law and the student's results, determine the value of the K. All you got to do is punch this in. And it says include units. The units don't need to be hard. So I have to find K for this. All I do is find this. So what's the half-life? Don't, don't be fancy. How long does it take for half of it to be gone? 10 hours, isn't it? Every 10 hours, I lose half of it. So all I do is punch this in. Can you get the right unit? This isn't tricky, but people make mistakes in this all the time. Now, if you did not recognize this was a uh, uh, using a half-life equation, or for some reason you thought this was some other order, remember, you can use this equation. And this is on your sheet. And then what you would do is you'd put a, a, the value, the initial value, here, so you put the point one zero here, and then you could put a half of that amount here, and you can solve for k by putting in. You still need to say a time. So in this case, I would have said ten hours because I'm saying. I mean, you could place it anywhere you want to find k there. Anything. You wouldn't have to do half. You could do anything you want. So you could you could find a spot where it goes, but now you're guessing at some point. So um, should have gotten this approximately. And then what's my unit? It's just inverse hours, isn't it? Time's always on the bottom, no matter what. It, it's just sitting there. There's nothing on the top. Like if there's nothing on the top, then it's inverse hours. If you don't like that, then put one over hour. That's all you needed. Don't overthink that. We're, we've been disconnected long enough on some of this that it sometimes doesn't come back to us as quickly as you'd like. Uh, finish it up. F sounds so tricky, and sometimes it doesn't need to be. It says, the student learns that the decomposition reaction uh, was run in a solution with a pH of 13. Briefly describe an experiment, including the initial conditions that you would change and the data you would gather to determine whether the rate of the reaction depends on the concentration of OH minus. So basically, they're making this sound really complicated, but they're saying if you reacted uh, this with OH minus instead, or in OH minus, uh, how could you see whether or not the rate of the reaction depends on that? Like, would it change the rate of the reaction? So, honestly, you would place it in. I'm going to start. I don't want to spend any time on this. It says perform the experiment at different concentrations of OH minus and measure how the concentration of the CO NH22 changes over time. Isn't that what this is basically doing? Hey, we decompose this and we measure the concentration of this over time. It's the same concept. You would react it with OH and then see over time how it would change. If it would change more or less, then you know if it affects the rate. If it mirrors that exact same path, then pH doesn't affect it, if that makes sense. So this is already happening naturally. If you do it in a, in a basic um, environment, 
does it get affected over time? No, they're tricky. Only because sometimes it's like, I don't know what else to say. And just say something. I would react it and, and look, mirror the same experiment. That's what I would do. Okay, over time, I would see what happens with the concentration of my, my compound. And measure it. Okay. Good. This is another 2017. Coming up. This is much shorter now. So they're going to get a lot shorter as we go through. So to answer the following questions about magnesium hydroxide, uh, they give us a KSP. Oh. All right, just two problems. So this is probably only worth four points. It says, A, calculate the number of grams. They give me a molar mass. So whenever I see that, I'm saying I'm probably going to be converting somehow, some way. That is dissolved in 100 mils of a saturated solution of MgOH2. Okay. They give you nothing else. So here's my instinct. First, you should, is giving me a KSP. Let's actually just write this out first. I like to visually see this. I think when they don't give this to you, it just makes it that much harder. They ask you to do it, then I'm just helping you out that much more. I'm going to give as much information here as I can for us because this is a review. This has nothing to do with any points yet, but that's what's happening, right? If I'm giving KSP, I'm taking a solid and I am breaking it down in with ion. If it asks me, show the reaction or the salt dissolving in water. We don't write water, we just show that. So the next next instinct I have is to actually write the KS, the equilibrium expression. Okay, just okay, if you don't feel like you need to, that's fine. But for tonight, let's just make sure we understand that. So that would be my expression. And potentially you could get a point for that, even if you don't uh, write it. Uh, it even though it's not asking you for that. So, here we go. When it asks for an amount and you are given nothing but the KSP, that will get me my answer. Okay? And I should actually bring this down one. So, think about this. This is going to break up. If it starts at zero, it's going to gain 2x and it gain x. So, these are actually the values that is going to be created of my ions. So, I can actually plug these in. And I can say 1.8 times 10 to the negative 11 equals x times 2x squared. And ultimately, right, 2x becomes 4x squared plus times another x. I rewrite this one more time. It's 4x cubed. I divide the 4. I take the cubed root on both sides. And my x becomes, and if you want to try that once, I'm going to give you a second to do that, just to make sure that we are getting that right. And we get that. What does that mean? That could be said to be the molar solubility. And technically, what ion is that? That's of Mg2+, plus, but that is a 1 to 1 ratio. All in red right there, I'm just trying to tell you and give you context of what that number means. So that is the kind, like if I just ask how much of that salt could be dissolved, what would be the molarity if you plop it into anything, that's what it would be, 1.65 times 10 to the negative 4. It's also of Mg2+, plus, but luckily the question is actually asking about NDOH2. So I didn't unfortunately ask, answer the question. I have to go a little bit further. So let's quickly see how that goes. So this is still continued. Whenever I am doing a problem, for some of us, I know that we would have already been lost in here, but you've got to keep trying to fight because you never know what you're going to get points on. I like to react, or I like to do any stoichiometry, any T chart calculation with molarity with mole over liter instead of writing M. It just I ensure that I don't mess this up. If I want grams, I need to be in moles, right? At some point. I'm not in moles yet. They told me it's 100 liters. I'm sorry, 100 milliliters, which is 0.1 liters. Now I'm in moles. So I'm not going to do something that I normally write here, but I'm going to just to get keep the theme of how I have this written. Right, 
because now my moles cancel out. <coughs> units, 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 units. The minute you know you have one unit and they tell you about another unit, just keep going. Well, I could do this, do it. Well, that could get me to this unit, go. Try it. You'd be amazed at where you can go. You should get an, a small number, it should not surprise you. Any KSP value is always going to be small. Not a lot of this is dissolving. We're never talking about something that is very soluble. They're always very insoluble, and we're just talking about how little it can go. This is two points. Almost every problem that is after, and this isn't actually number three, this was number six on the exam. Anything that only has like two problems or three, that's not a 10 point question then. So this is only going to take like seven minutes, they say. Uh, it's going to be four question, uh, points total. So one point was earned for calculating this. Even if you didn't get any further. So if you recognize, hey, I need to put this in the KSP value, that's a point, and then one point is earned for the mass. All right, we did letter B, but I, I think it's important. I, I feel like we've covered this a lot, which is good, because they are going to probably bring it up. But it resets. So even if you messed up, if you haven't noticed on your final when we went through that stuff, these problems reset on these little problems quite often. The energy required to separate the ions in the MgOH2 crystal lattice is indivi into individual ions is represented in the table below. It is known as the lattice energy. As shown in the table, the lattice energy of strontium hydroxide is less than the lattice energy of MgOH2, explained in terms of the periodic properties in Coulomb's law. It's all one thing, though. When I say lattice energy, just please write this again so we have done it and it's in our minds. It's about charge and it's about size, right? And that's a relationship. And you don't have to memorize it if you just remember the QQ over R, and I know that's maybe asking a lot. But the greater the number on the top, the greater the value of my lattice energy. The smaller the number on the bottom, the greater value for my lattice energy, right? So all I got to do is explain why the lattice energy of of um, MgOH2 is greater than SrOH2. And I would always talk about both, even if they're the same. I, say, I could say, like, although this is the same, this is not. And only focus on the things that are different. If you are talking about hydroxide, you're wasting your time. They both have hydroxide. You can't be like, well, hydroxide has this, while hydroxide has this. <laughs> I hope you're saying the same answer on that, by the way. So... You get to B, what are we really talking about? Size, because charge is not a factor. They are both, but I would talk about it. I would say they both have but now you got to make sure you make this make sense. Mg has a greater lattice energy, so make sure you're saying it right. But Mg has a smaller atomic radius. You said something else, you're probably fine. And if you want to hammer this home, it is not a bad idea. If it, start, if it says anything about being specific, all you need to say is where they are on the table. So what you could say is M MG, I mean, you could do it in parentheses if you're feeling like, I'm going to get too worried. Or once I start writing, I can't stop. Um, you could say MG, uh, third energy level, versus You're just reinforcing it, right? You're saying, hey, I know, I know, I'm telling you, I know. And it's good to go. Uh, one point is earned for correct comparison of the cat ion sizes, and then one point is earned for indicating uh, that smaller distances lead to a greater lattice energy. So you'd have to, I probably didn't hammer that home. You should have said, I should have said this then, smaller atomic radius, which gives it a stronger lattice energy. So I will write that. Just, I, 
always try to make sure you say that that, and that is what it, that's why it has a greater or a smaller uh, whatever. Okay. So. so this is another 2017 question. Man, I'm giving you all the current stuff. So a student wants to determine the concentration of hydrogen peroxide in a solution of hydrogen peroxide. Uh, the student can use one of the two titrates, either dichromate ion or the cobalt-2 ion. The balanced chemical equations for the two reactions are below. They give you these really long equations. So the half reactions of the uh, E values, or the cell potential values, uh, related to the titrations above are given in the following table. So this is about just taking a breath and understanding what's really asking. I don't think this is really that difficult of a beginning question, but I can see why people would have made it such. Because A... Use the information in the table to calculate the following. So it asks for two different values. And this is the part where I think people make mistakes. So first, if I want to know the value of each of these, it's not asking give the potential cell value of, of the reaction that's going to occur. These have already been written. Okay, these are established. So what you need to do is find two that relate and reflect those reactions. So what I would suggest right now, I'm not saying this is right. I would suggest taking an arrow and like going, okay, these two will go to here, or this one and that one. Find the ones that actually relate, okay? I'm going to give you a moment. You're just finding out the, the overall voltage, though, of each of these reactions. See if you can find which ones you would need, okay? And see what you have to do with it. Give it a shot. I feel the challenge with this is that there is hydrogen peroxide in both these, okay? <laughs> what you need to do is recognize the other parts of these reactions. So this one has uh, H uh, plus. This one has O2. So when I want this first, this first reaction right here is between these two, because here's my oxygen, okay? And here's my dichromate. So this other one, if you did not find these, I, then you're not going to get the right answers for that. Secondly, you need to see what was flipped. All of these have the electrons on the left. Something has to flip every time I do uh, half reactions and they give me a, a cell voltage, okay? So what you need to do is recognize which one's on which side. Well, this right here, oxygen, for example, is on the left and the right. That one apparently was flipped. So that's my, by the way, I know that that's this first one because it's dealing with the dichromate. So this value has to flip. So if I was going to show my work, I could say 1.33 plus negative 0.07. You wouldn't have to do all these other arrows. Like, that's showing my work right there. Like the other one, if you look at these problems, and I'll erase what I have here first, so we can see it, is that the cobalt's right there, and so it is, whoops, but it's not, right? See how that's the 2 plus? And that's the 2 plus. Whoa. And this stuff right here is on the side, so this is the one that has to flip because it has to get to the other side. So my work would be 1.84 plus 1.77. So you got a point for each of those. Now, you see it after it goes, oh, that's not so bad. But I bet a lot of us had that mixed up. So we didn't get the right answers. But that's how I recognize it. So if you're given equations already and then you're given values, you just have to figure out which one goes to which, what was flipped, what wasn't flipped. Yeah. Why would you multiply the plus and the minus? It doesn't work like that. For voltages, that, that is all carried out by uh, concentrations and rates of reaction. So that's different than like Hess's law with enthalpy. Okay. okay, so anytime we have electron voltages, just all your job is to do is figure out which one you flip. That is it. Okay, now, I don't think the... Re look, this is the problem. Whatever you have here, I think your answer depends on it. I'm assuming, I would hope, that you would get points potentially. It says, based on the calculated value, so by the fact that they say based on that, the student must choose which titration reaction is thermodynamically favorable. So I, which one should, be, uh, which one should they choose? So you could do reactions and things like that uh, and actually show uh, using a calculation with voltage. So that's um, the change in G equals negative NF 
E. I think that's on your orange sheet. But what's the right answer? It's going to be the dichromate because it's positive. And I would literally say it. The dichromate or the CR207 because it has a positive voltage. That's it. So when we're talking about voltage to be spontaneous or be thermodynamically favorable, you need a positive voltage, right? So it would be the CR207 because the voltage is positive. Double I. Calculate. So now we do have to calculate. The value of change in G in kilojoules per mole, please make sure you do the proper unit for the reaction between what you chose. So whatever you chose, that's what you get. So whenever you are asked to do an equation, please just look at your equation sheet to make sure that you're finding the right one. Change in G. We got like six options, maybe five. And the one, correct me if I'm wrong, it looks like, I think it looks like that. Okay, so I'm going to take a step back, make sure that you calculate this correctly because there are uh, parts of this that we can make a mistake on. Usually this is worth two points. Usually. What's my N? <laughs> six. I hear six. Anybody else? That Four? Three? Okay, we just showing up numbers. My bit is higher. <laughs> six is hardly four. <laughs> okay, so... First off, we're doing, you got to know what you're doing. You're using this reaction. It's very important. Okay? So the electrons have to match. So it's least common multiple. If I have six and this other one's two, two can go in the six. So it would be six. Can you guys help me out once? What would it be for if, if you thought it was the other one? Because it would be right if you chose the other one at this point. It would be two, right? Because they have two electrons here and one there. If this was a 2 and that's a 3, it'd go back to 6 for that. Okay? So that's 6. This is roughly this. Bless you. I know on your sheet, I think it's uh, 4, 8, 5 at the ending. Uh, but that, that's fine. And then your voltage just goes in here. And I get my final answer. Um, you do need to understand one thing, and it says this way on the bottom of your sheet. I want you to rec I want you to find this on your own sheet if you brought it. It says one volt. This is just all of what you need to know. I, I don't care if these units all match up or not. When you write this like this, I know right now that nothing, you don't have volts at all. Like It's not like, oh, hey, magically it just comes out. But volts equal, what does it say, one joule per charge? A coulomb. A coulomb. That makes no sense. So it's in joules. That's what you need to understand. It's sitting right there. This answer is not in kilojoules. This answer is not in kilojoules. And that, that's the important part of this. And unfortunately, you would have it wrong if it weren't. So when it's all said and done, you get approximately this value. Uh, most times when we're doing Gs, Hs, Ss, if you don't do it per mole, you're fine. But if the answer is actually asking it per mole, just write per mole. It's fine. You're done. So it's approximately, I don't know if it actually comes out exactly like that. I'm just writing what I have. Yeah. So that's just a point. Why do I say normally it's two points? Because usually you get a point for recognizing the end. Normally you get a point for that. Maybe they've just gotten rid of that now. So that was a nice little uh, problem dealing with some uh, electrochem and some thermodynamics all in one. All right. Got two left and we're done. This one was from two years ago. And this gave a lot of students some troubles, and I think this is a good one to look at. Short. They give you an equation. They give you K. So then your mind's got to, you got to kind of get into what you're doing. Okay, so K equilibrium, products over reactants, uh, maybe an ice box, and things like that. Um, it doesn't even hurt to, as you start, if you know you have to do calculations, look at your orange sheet. I have to see one. I have an orange sheet. And, obviously, and please don't rip it out on Monday. You cannot rip out your equation sheet. That's why I try to do it that way on your exam. Um, uh, phenol is a weak acid that partially dissociates in water according to the equation above. A, what is the pH of that solution? So what are they basically saying? They're saying this is a weak acid. They just said it. And they gave you a concentration. They want a pH. I'm, I'm not going to say, can you figure that out? We have done this a ton of times. I would say hundreds and hundreds of times. That's a little exaggerated. 
You guys, if you're given an equation that has H plus or OH minus on the right side of it, that means that it can be calculated to find a pH right then. Like it's ready to go. It has the ability to do that. Um, this, to me, screams. Now, I'm not saying all of you have to do this. Uh, when we were in the middle of this chapter, most of you at some point did not do an icebox for this kind of a problem anymore, but that was months ago. Um, so I want to just make sure that you visually see this. I also think sometimes you start an icebox, you go, oh, I see what's happening. But you at least started it and it organized your, your information in your brain. So it has to gain, then assume, you, you assume if you're not told something, you don't have it. So, I hadn't said it yet, but what is this? This is classic x squared over initial minus x equals my k. A lot of times the problem will ask you for a ka first, and you have to show it, but that would just be products over reactants. So I can jump right into this because they did not ask me for that. So here's my k. I'm, I'm writing it out a little more than I need to. You will not, I have never seen a problem ask for a quadratic. Why did you make us do it? Because I'm trying to actually just teach you how to do normal chemistry problems as well. So you solve for it. X equals my H plus, which is the thing that I care about the most. And that is 9.2 times 10 to the negative 6. That is one point. So if you got to that, that was a point. I show everything. Monday is not a day to assume. So the pH is 5.04. So that's half the points. Now we get to a problem that looks really unique. And don't let format mess you up. It doesn't have to. So it says for a certain reaction involving the C6H5OH to proceed at a significant rate, the phenyl or phenol must be primarily in its depronated form. So it needs to be mostly in here. When I read this, what it basically is saying is, I need more of this. That's what it's saying. It needs to be in that, primarily in that. Like, this can get very confusing. So don't be afraid to make little notes or some sort of depiction of like, okay, I'm needing that species versus this one. In order to ensure that the C6H5OH is depronated, the reaction must be conducted in a buffered solution. On the number scale below, circle each, underline, pH for which... More than 50% of the phenol molecules are in the depronated form, this one. That's my answer. Okay, they gave you a huge hint. What was the, the phrase that might actually help? Does anybody pick it up what kind of thing I'm looking at here? Maybe you see it, maybe you don't. There's, a, there's an equation I can use. They gave me a huge hint. If I have a buffer solution, you guys, a buffer can be easily calculated using henderson hasselbach equation. Okay? More specifically, which one's my base? Well, this gains an H, so this loses. So this is my acid. This is my base. This is one of those problems where I'm literally talking about this. The concentration of my acid versus my base. All I want is this to be a little greater, right? That's it. So this is how I can do this as easily as possible. Instead of, and you could make up a value, but what if I made them equal? And then I talk about which way it goes. So if I make them equal, I can just say I have one of these and one of these. What does that do to this, this right here? Comes one, log of one is zero. Okay, so if I make this one and one, this becomes zero. So now I'm sitting with pH equals pKa. So here I go. So what is my pKa? pH equals negative log of 1.12 times 10 negative 10. The word buffer, that is henderson hasselbach equation. Uh, henderson hasselbach equation means that I have amounts of my acid in my base. The amount of my base in my conjugate acid, whatever, however you want to do it, I have uh, amounts of each on each side of my equation. So I get this pH, 
What was it, 9.95? Yep. Okay. So, what do I want? I want this one to be just a little bit more, right? So what would that reflect as? Is it going to be greater or less than this? Yeah, it's going to be greater than this. Sorry, I was rereading how they asked the question. So basically, I need a pH that's greater than 9.95 to then make it so I have a little more base. So what would I circle? Because each. This was the question that everybody afterwards, what did you circle? What did you circle? And everybody wanted to know. So that's how you got it, though. This is not a guessing game, though. So you got it. Just take a breath. I mean, some of you are going to have a ton of time. Don't shut it down and go, okay, what else could I have used for this? How could I get a value? How can I get a value showing ra ratios? If it's a ratio, this is about the only equation that we have for a ratio with concentrations. And when you're talking about acids and bases, it's sitting there. Like, you should visually look at that. You should see it in that equilibrium uh, section on your equation sheet. And you should just jump up. You get one point for circling 10 to 14, and you get one point for justification. The math is justification. That, that would be plenty to do for that. Okay? And if you wanted to go down in a different direction, you may not have exactly done it that way, but you could have slowly been calculating and instead of doing PKA, you could have had negative log right away. And so on and so forth. So, anyway, those are only four points. Final question. It's a big one. And this one is from 2016 as well. So I all night tonight, all we've done are tests that are one or two years old. That's it. So it's very fresh. We've changed the format over the last four years only. So uh, these are going to be pretty accurate for us. I love lab questions as review because I think these are the hardest ones. So I think it's important to see them. So it's important to underline, make some notes, understand the situation. Don't jump into it too quickly. So the, uh, they give you an equation, and unfortunately, it doesn't give us a lot. It says, determine the molar mass of an unknown metal, M. A student reacts iodine with excess, with an excess of the metal to form a water-soluble compound, Mi2. So that means it's going to dissolve, as represented in the equation above. The reaction proceeds until all of the I2 is consumed. The Mi2 solution is quantitatively collected and heated to remove the water, and the product is dried and weighed to constant mass. The experimental steps are represented below, followed by a data table. So you can kind of understand what's happening here. So... Um, just understand, see the numbers on the balance? They're in the data table. That's kind of nice. So I had the beaker, and then I had my metal of M, and then I reacted or added I2, um, and then I added water, then the reaction actually occurs, sorry, and then I slowly am left with just my Mi2 at the end. So I actually added just I2 separate from M. So they're just sitting together, and that's what that black and gray picture shows. They're not mixed yet. So, like, they're just, they're, they're separate, okay, but they're sitting together. Here we go. A, given that the metal M is in excess, calculate the number of moles of I2 that reacted. Okay, so, I'll give you one hint. This is very minimal math. I'm going to pause this, though. Can you try to figure out how much I2 you have, and then can you get it to moles? So think about the data that was given to you. I'm going to give you only about a minute here to figure out. If you can't see it, you can't see it, but try it, because these are the ones that I feel free students a lot. When looking at lab problems, you can finish up if you're still calculating, but don't overthink things. When you want something that's in a data table, and there's other items on the data table that are part of that line, that's a subtraction. I want I2. So all I need to do is subtract everything that is not I2. So I'm just going to take those two values in the beginning. So I have 127.570 minus 126.549. And I get one point, I'll do it down here. I'm in grams. I can now get into uh, moles. So, 
obviously if you didn't recognize that, you're going to not get the right answer. But don't overthink things. Just when they break it down like that, you know, it could be like crucible, crucible cover, uh, compound and water. And then it says like, what's the mass of the water? Well, can you find something that has water, uh, everything but the water? So find the one that says compound, crucible, and crucible cover. Oh wait, that's all of the things but the one that I am looking for. Great, so track those two, or whatever. All right, B. So calculate the molar mass of the unknown metal M. All right, so now think about what's given to you. Think about, um, if, if you don't have enough information, then there must be information either given to you uh, by a reaction, like a balanced equation, or it could still be hidden in my problem. Give you a little hint. We talked about this in homeroom just yesterday. Uh, what is molar mass? That might help me a little bit. So uh, I'm only going to give you a minute on this. If you're stuck, I'll give you a hint. Uh, chemical equation. That's probably going to help you. The reaction. Equation is about as simple as it gets. M plus I2 gives you Mi2. So if I have a certain amount of I2, it equals the amount of M that I have. Right? I mean, that, that's basically what it would be. So uh, it's important to have that as an understanding. So that is going to be with moles. So the moles of my M equals the moles of my I2. Why do I need that? Because molar mass... <coughs> is grams per mole. So I need both items. Okay? What do I get the grams? The grams are from my table. Right? Here's M. What do I want to get rid of? Mass of beaker. Because if I subtract the mass of beaker out of there, I'm left with M. So there's two parts to this. There definitely are. So I need to also do that. And I'm sorry, hold on. So here's my mistake. What are they saying? What do they say about the M? This is my fault. You know what? I probably fell in their trap. That M is in excess. So the reaction, this is the important part. I have right here, um, and they're both the same. And I have a certain amount of Mi2. Well, I know, because the other one was eliminating reactant, how much I2 I have of my Mi2. So if you did that, good for you. You would have gotten a point more than me. Um, I messed it up. So I have, I, I will label it below. I have no pride at this point. So this is of my Mi2. All right, if I subtract the I2 right here, That will result in only an M. So my fault on that. Definitely my fault. Um, so I take that and then I divide it by my molar mass, which I, or sorry, my moles, which gets me my molar mass. And my moles will be the same as my I because, or I too, because they are equal in molar ratio. One point is earned for the number of grams of M, one point is earned for the molar mass. I am not certain that if I would have made that mistake, if I would have gotten points for the molar mass, I might have. I still understood that the mole part worked. I like to think that I would. Uh, I'll keep telling myself. The student hypothesizes that the compound formed in the synthesis reaction is ionic. So they're saying that Mi2 is ionic. Propose an experimental test that the student could perform that could be used to support the hypothesis. Explain how the results of the test would support it. So this is what you need to do. You need to say, like, they could do this, and this would be the result. That's, that's what the uh, result would be. Um, so, for example, if they're like, uh, prove that it's a metal, or prove that there's uh, sodium in there, you could say, well, I could put it in a flame, and it would have what color? I told you you had to memorize sodium. A yellowish color. And then you say, oh, it, that would prove it. Something like that. So how can I prove that something's ionic? First off, let's talk about what the word ionic means. It means that it would have charges, right? Like that's big. How can I prove something has charges? You do this 
two years ago, but we have some probes that do these kinds of things, and we also have some other weird things that you could do. Um, and if you don't know, that's fine, but what what happens in an ionic uh, solution? What is it? It has a voltage. There's another word for that. It starts with a C. Current. Charge, current, conductivity. So, I mean, you could... You could put a probe and test that there's conductivity. What did uh, middle school or anything else you ever see? They what did they put inside to prove that it's like a there's a current in there? Not a penny. <laughs> not a finger. <laughs> not a finger. <laughs> like, oh boy. Uh, you can put like a, a a contraption like with a light bulb to show that a current uh, uh, runs through it, and that might not be. You're like what? So. Some way you could prove though that it conducts electricity. So if you did that, because there's a current, it, 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 there's charges in there. So it, there's a current, or it, 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 uh, it uh, conducts electricity. Um, here's another one that I we don't talk about too much, but if it's ionic, it means it has a really strong crystal lattice. So it takes a lot of energy to overcome. So you could say our brains probably don't go to this. But it, you could try to melt it, and if it's a really high melting point, that would prove that it's ionic. That's a little bit harder. So to me, what I would do is I would dissolve it in water and see if it conducts electricity. Okay, I will read what it says. It says, student could dissolve the compound in water or melt the compound and see if the solution melt conduct, conducts electricity. If the solution conducts electricity, mobile ions are capable of carrying the charge. So actually, it didn't say that you needed to uh, show, show that there's a light bulb uh, that's lit up. But that's, that's how what I was envisioning. You do this contraction that looks like this. There's a little light bulb, and then you have these two things, and then uh, voila, it would light up because of the charges. So basically, you can prove that it conducts electricity, or that if it does conduct electricity, then there's charges. All right, then we only have a couple left. Student hypothesizes that Br2 will react with metal M more vigorously than I2 did because Br2 is a liquid at room temperature. So they're just saying a state. So sometimes, again, when I'm doing this problem, then I need to kind of understand what they're saying. So they're saying that Br2 is a liquid. I'm assuming then they're saying that I2 is a solid. OK, that's what they're saying. So here's my situation again. Explain why I2 is a solid at room temperature, whereas Br2 is a liquid. Your explanation should clearly reference the types and relative strengths of intermolecular forces. All right, I'm going to pause this. This is a big one. Can you state why? It should be about one. Okay, here we go. Again, always state what they have first. So I like to always state what the uh, IMFs have. Do they have different IMFs? They're the same. They both have LBs. I say that. So okay. Now maybe you don't know yet, but you should be able to figure out the very fact that one's a solid, one's a liquid. The one that has the solid has stronger, weaker IMFs. Stronger. They're stickier, right? They're staying together. A liquid a little weaker, gas much weaker. So what is the strength uh, being strong or weak have to do with LBs? It's the size of the electron cloud or of the atom or whatever you want. If you can remember the cloud, that's a little bit better. So you just look at them. Uh, that I2 has stronger IMFs. Because, what? We actually haven't said it yet. It has a larger electron cloud. Now, if you want to go in and show off your fancy terminology and say, which can cause more induced dipoles, and you're like, no, no, who cares? Uh, that's fine, but you probably don't need to, or higher electron cloud, which makes it more polarizable, great. But because it has. Have the larger electron cloud. I will read what they have though. Both Br2 and I2 molecules are nonpolar molecules, therefore, the only possible intermolecular forces are London dispersion. The LD forces are stronger in I2 because it is larger in size, with more electrons, and/or more 
polarizable electron cluster. A stronger London force in I2 results in a higher melting point, which makes I2 a solid lumen. Here's how you get points, though. I'm loving that coin that does this thing. So I became a One point is earned for identifying that there's London. One point is earned for explaining that the forces are stronger in I2. So that's all you needed to say. E, which solution should the student add to I2 to reduce it to I minus? Circle your answer below, justify your answer, including a calculation of E uh, for the overall reaction. All right, this is not that tricky. Think about what it's saying. Which solution should be at, uh, the student should add add to I two to reduce it to I minus? Circle your answer. Literally, you don't even have to understand half of that terminology. You have to create the reaction that it's describing. So give it a shot and get a calculation. And I, what I love is for you to get to the next one too and do F. So what is the overall metionic equation for the reaction? And then we are done after I go over it. Okay. First, first truth, these are all uh, reductions. One of these has to flip. So if we didn't recognize that, so if you're like, well, I don't know which one to pick out of all these. Well, I want to reduce I2 to I minus. So right here, this one can't flip because I'm going from I2 to I minus. I'm just breaking this down, what they're telling me right now, okay? So that means the, one of these two has to flip. It's just that simple. That's it. They have to flip. So if I flip this one, it becomes negative, and what happens? My voltage is negative. That ain't good. That isn't good. So I have to flip this one. So this one's going to flip. So now this is over here, and this is over here. So what is being added to my I2? S2. O3. You see that? This is being added. Okay, so justification, honestly, what I just wrote, um, I just did the math here, so I just I just wrote them out, and I, I circled it, and then I just wrote this plus and then you could say the reaction between the SO2, O3, and I2 creates a voltage of plus 0.46. If you feel like you haven't said enough, you could say uh, the other reactions would create a negative voltage. What's the overall equation then? You just need to write these out. The electrons are the same, so I put I2 plus 2, I just write it all down. Why don't I have to double anything? Because I had the same number of electrons. You got one point, by the way, in the previous one for picking the right answer, and then one point for the justification. The last one, you just get a single point.